everybody. Welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome to episode number 105 of CAF Warbird Tube. Now, before we get started tonight, could you do, do us a favor? I know many of you have already done this, and I appreciate it, but if you haven't done it so far, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, click the bell icon to get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube uh, when they are posted. All right. So as you're watching tonight, I think maybe some questions might pop up. And if you have a question, just type it in the chat box and we'll try to get it either answered during the show or before we sign off. Tonight, we uh, welcome back historian Scott Thompson. He will join us to talk about Talmance Aviation. Now, you may not recognize the name right away, but I know you will know their work. And Scott, welcome back. Glad to have you here at the Warbird Tube. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk about something that's near and dear to me. I've, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of an obscure subject, but mm -hmm. once you dig into it a little bit, you find out a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't realize was going on uh, back in the, actually through the whole, from the 1930s forward with making motion pictures and the involvement of aviation in, in, in movies and not just movies, but other facets of aviation, the tall man's aviation and the predecessors of the company, Paul Mance and Frank Tallman, what they brought to aviation. So we're going to talk about both these gentlemen and the company that they created uh, when they came together in 1961. They both had a bit of a history, Paul Mance in particular, prior to 1961. And we're kind of touch bases on that a little bit. But this company was based at Orange County Airport in Southern California. And through the years, beginning before Paul Mance was formed, uh, Paul Mance was heavily involved in motion picture productions from the 1930s on. And I just have a few here highlighted uh, that most people who follow aviation uh, have seen or have heard of movies like 12 o'clock high and strategic air command spirit of st louis and once tall man's came together as a company they continued to work uh producing uh work that showed up in mad mad world flight of the phoenix uh, murphy's war america the beautiful the circle vision production and this is just a very small fraction of what the work what this, this company put together uh, in support of Hollywood productions. Uh, Catch 22 is a major effort by Tall Man's Aviation back in the in 1969. And then uh, a lot of people who enjoy aviation movies are well familiar with uh, the great Waldo Pepper and Tall Man's Aviation was was critical to the production of that film. Like I said, Coleman's Aviation is kind of near and dear to me. I grew up near Orange County Airport, and I used to spend a lot of time at the airport, and in particular paying attention to what was going on at Coleman's Aviation. They were located in the southern end of the airport, and I followed them through the years. The first article I ever wrote um, showed up in September 1980, and it was a story, a very, pretty long story about uh, about Coleman's Aviation. So. It's something I've paid a lot of attention to over the years, and I've realized there's a lack of information, so I've dedicated a large part of my website to Tallman's Aviation and some of the very obscure stories that few people care about, but I think it's important to document at this point. Um, so we're going to start talking about Paul Manns because he's kind of the guy who the story really revolves around. Paul Mance was a uh, started flying in the 20s, and he first started getting involved in producing in, in motion picture production, flying for for the films in 1931. 
and he broke into the in the movies by flying an airplane through a hangar at Bishop Airport, um, which gave him some notoriety and got him uh, into the into the business. And he in the he was based at uh, what's now the Burbank Airport in Southern California, and he was central to all of the movie work that occurred in the 1930s. His company gradually took over the business in that decade. He all the other movie pilots eventually came to work with him or for him. He produced, uh, he had camera airplanes. He was an, certified as an aerial director. Um, he was a very talented pilot and he would work out what Hollywood wanted when they wanted it. So he was intrinsically involved in, in Hollywood. He, uh, he, would, he hobnobbed with the stars. He carried, he flew them around the country to get married and divorced and on vacations. He uh, he worked with them, made all the parties, did all the, he had all the connections with the with the studios, and that really made him essential to any type of movie that required an airplane, either to film it or to be in front of the cameras. Also, when he was well known in the 30s, as he was the technical advisor for Amelia Earhart in the mid 30s, and he worked with her for two years, uh, getting her ready to make her uh, several of her record setting trips, but the, the, the around the world trip in, in 1937 that ended tragically, he was somewhat involved and he um, it didn't end well for her, but, and I think some of, there was a little bit of tension between the two of them because she was doing things that he didn't think were such a hot idea, and it, as it turned out, they they really had some gaping holes in their planning, and uh, and when she was lost in the Pacific, of course, he was um, devastated by that. Um, he continued through the 30s, and he became well known in the 40s after World War II as an air race pilot. He flew uh, and won the first three post-war Bendix races uh, with his P-51 Mustangs. He won the 46, 47, and 48 Bendix races. And then people started asking to retire from rave racing because he kept winning the races. So he eventually, uh, after World War II, he centralized all of his camera ships basically into this B-25 that, he, that he, he picked up as a surplus airplane in 1946. And it was eventually modified with a special camera nose on it. And all through the 19, mid 40s until Paul Mance Aviation was formed in 1961, this airplane was uh, Paul Mance's uh, signature around the world. As you can see, there's a map on the side of the airplane. He made at least three worldwide trips in this airplane doing film projects for uh, for Cinerama primarily, and also uh, some other productions, but he was well known internationally flying this airplane. Uh, and it, it was an airplane that uh, he, like I say, became signa his signature airplane. Cinerama is something that really became a, a big part of what Paul Mance was doing. They, the Cinerama uh, technique used three motion picture cameras to film simultaneously to pr provide a widescreen uh, production in the theater. They would project the three films simultaneously in the same way that they were originally filmed to make a widescreen uh, production com uh, that was combined with uh, some excellent sound production for the 1950s. And Cinerama uh, the first Cinerama film was done in 1952, and then Mance was involved with a, another four of them in the in the next 10 years. His airplane was ideally suited to film, and a lot of the air-to-ground shots that showed up in those productions were all done uh, from his B-25. This is Paul Mance in the in the mid 1950s, uh, a little bit heavier, a little bit uh, a little bit more mature, but B-25 in the background as the, the world map that documented some of the flights he made around uh, doing all the filming. 
Uh, it, Scott, the the uh, Cinerama technique was that something that he developed, or was it? No, it that... was it was developed actually before World War II, uh, oh. and it but it didn't really become well well known until World War II, and they actually used it for some gunnery simulators. And then after World War II, there was an effort, primarily because of television, to beat back the uh, migration from the movie theater to the living room. And Cinerama was a way to get a very wide screen picture in the theaters. Unfortunately, because it required three cameras and three motion picture projectors and a lot of technicians to run it, it was very expensive and it didn't really take on. Uh, they did make, a, like I say, about seven or eight of the films, but eventually they developed some widescreen single camera um, techniques so they didn't have to use the three cameras to do the filming. But Mance was well known for the work he did with this, and uh, that's one of his hallmarks. Um, but in the late 50s, there were some other competitors showing up, and even though Mance held most of the um, business, there were guys like Frank Tolman who were coming along. Frank Tolman was a naval aviator, naval aviator um, coming out of World War II. He was an instructor in the war, and he flew, I think, Corsairs and uh, probably Bearcats and uh, in Naval Reserve. But his first love were, were the antique airplanes, particularly the World War I vintage airplanes. And he started collecting them, not necessarily to use them in motion picture productions, but just because he liked the old airplanes. He rebuilt them, he traded them around, he flew them. You can tell in this picture right here, he, he enjoyed the, uh, the charisma of a World War I aviator. And he built up a good collection of, of these older vintage airplanes. And in the, uh, about 1957, he realized that he could have a career flying them in the movies. So he moved his whole operation from Illinois to Flaybob Airport in Southern California, and he set up shop there. And he, he didn't have the connections Mance had, uh, but he did get a, a major break in 1958, I believe, or 59. He was uh, involved in a major film that Mance was not involved in, Lafayette Escadrille. And uh, he made a name for himself in that movie, and he started getting business. Um, when Mance couldn't handle something, a lot of times they called Frank Tolman. And he not only had his World War I collection, he also had some World War II aircraft he had. And so he was starting to edge in a little bit on Paul Mance's business to the point where Mance and Tolman came together and decided to merge their operations Paul Mance was kind of kind of done with some of the more hazardous movie flying, and he was ha he was happy to kind of start taking a back seat, going to semi-retirement. So in 1961, Paul Mance and Frank Tallman got together, and they created Tall Mance Aviation. It was incorporated in uh, late 1961, and and Frank Tallman moved all his his collection over from Flaybob to Orange County, which is where they set up shop. And this is a picture of them right after they merged their operation, Paul Mance. Obviously, he's uh, in his late 50s here. He looks a little bit older than that, actually. And Frank Tolman would be about 15 years younger than him. So they considered with Mance's connections and Tolman's enthusiasm, they were going to have quite a go of it. A picture of uh, Frank Tolman in uh, Paul Mance's Boeing 100, which is actually a P-12. And that airplane was used, uh, well, Tolman loved to fly it, but it was also used as a camera plane, and it was well uh, it was well used by Tolman. So it's on, now, currently, this airplane is owned by uh, Kermit Weeks down in Florida. But one of the other efforts that uh, Tolman's Aviation wanted to do was to put their large aircraft collection on display. And Paul Mance had always wanted to put together a museum, and that was finally realized in 1963, when they opened Movie Land of the Air Museum on uh, Orange County Airport. And there was a lot of airplanes displayed. Um, and back then, these airplanes were not 
considered to be, they would not meet any type of restorative uh, standard today. These airplanes, most of them are working airplanes. They were modified, they were repainted, they were converted to look like something else. Um, but they had the airplanes and they put them on display. And then when they needed an airplane for a movie, they'd roll it out of the hangar and fly it off to Hollywood. It was quite a museum. That was how I got introduced to Call Man's Aviation was to go to the movie land of the Air Museum. And it was quite a it was quite a museum there in the, from about 1963 when it opened up for, for 10, 10 to 15 years. It was a, a going museum and it was a tourist destination in Southern California. Uh, the upper right photo there, you can see one of Paul Mance's Mustang, his P-51 C air racers. And all through the rest of the museum, they had displays from different movies and um, the airplanes themselves that were used in this very good little museum. That's another view of uh, Paul Mance's uh, P-12, painted as a Navy fighter. And as this article indicates, this was 1965, I believe. Paul Mance was was tired of doing the precision flying. He was looking to kind of step back from the business, and that's what frankly, why he had uh, combined with uh, with uh, Frank Tallman. And so he was taking a back seat. He was spending more time in Balboa on his yacht and less time flying airplanes for the films. But in 1965, um, the 12 Minutes Aviation was hired to, to provide the flying for the film Flight of the Phoenix. And as part of this uh, filming project, they built a, basically it was a three-quarter scale boom of a C-119, or C-82, actually, C-82. C and anybody who's seen the film knows, knows the backstory. Uh, this crew that crashed in the desert, they rebuilt an airplane, and they, out of a C-82, they built a, a makeshift airplane. And so Tom Mance put this together, and it was constructed of uh, parts from a BT-13. It has it had C-45 wings, and all, all the aft structure was all wood. Uh, so it was kind of a cobbled together airplane. Tallman was supposed to fly for the film. Uh, Mance ended up flying it because Tallman was injured. Um, and as most people probably have heard or know that, that this airplane crashed during the filming and killing Mance. Uh, in 1965, July of 1965, he was killed. Uh, the stuntman on board the airplane was badly injured. Um, it was obviously a huge tragedy for, for Tomas Aviation, losing uh, one of their, not only a good friend, but they lost a, the inside track on business in Hollywood. And there were a flurry of lawsuits that, that um, were filed after the accident. And the result of that was Frank Tallman, um, who, as a result of an earlier ground accident, had lost one of his legs that was amputated to save his life. So he was out of the business for a while. Frank, Paul Mance was killed, and Tom Mance was facing a huge crush of bills and problems. So they ended up auctioning. Actually, I'll take it back. They ended up selling a good part of their collection to some Nebraska investors. And they, the investors thought that they were gonna be able to start another air museum or sell this large collection to another air museum. So they started marking it around. And this, there was probably close to probably 50 airplanes and a lot of displays. And it was kind of like a turnkey museum if anybody would purchase it from this company. Well, nobody did purchase it from the company. So these airplanes remained on display at Tom Mance Aviation after they were sold in 1966 until 1968 when the investor company decided they had to get rid of these airplanes. So there was a huge auction that was held uh, in May of 1968 that sold off this collection. And 
it was a well attended auction. Some of these airplanes, P-40, I think, sold for about seven thousand. The highest bringing, the highest sold line, I believe, was a Southwest Camel that brought forty thousand dollars. But most of the World War II vintage stuff all sold for under ten thousand. And these airplanes have been on display at Tolman's, even though they didn't own them. And then they, after May of '68, they they left Orange County and went to the new owners. So. Fortunately, Tallman still had a lot of airplanes in their collection that they pulled out from storage and they rebuilt their museum. But it wasn't quite the same after that. Between, after losing Mance and losing most of their airplanes, it was kind of a slow start back. But Frank Tallman pushed on. The company enjoyed a resurgence in the late 60s and all through the 1970s. Uh, it was quite successful. This is a picture of one of their camera ships that was used to uh, film the, some circle vision projects. The, the emblem on the nose uh, indicated it was used for Expo 67 in Canada. It was one of the Walt Disney pro projects that was done for the Canadians, and it was only one of several of these projects that uh, Tallman's did. We'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute. I'm kind of going kind of fast here. Maybe I should slow down. I thought, this was, I thought I was going to run out of time here, but I'm moving along pretty good here. If there's any questions or anything, please jump up. Sure, sure. Um, as we're looking at the, the, the B-25 and the, the camera nose, is that, um, is that a, a curtain or something that's, that's yeah. on the nose? Okay. Yeah, it was a curtain, um, probably just to protect the, the cameras that would have been in there um, from, from light and just basically providing a measure of protection. The earlier camera nose had windows in the camera nose besides the plexiglass that was for the camera, and those those caused a lot of reflection problems. So they eventually covered all those windows with curtains, and then they eventually painted over the windows. But they still retained a curtain in the nose. See, in, in this case, the nose position wasn't necessarily used for filming because the circle vision was the uh, camera that hung out of the Bombay that had a 360 degree view. And I think I have some other pictures of that later on. Okay. But yeah, it was, uh, it was just a protective curtain. Um, the nose was custom built for tall man's aviation and the, the glass on the nose was a very expensive creation because it had to be optically clear. So it was a cylindrical section that was cut out and the whole idea was you could shoot at different points through the glass and not have any distortion from the from the curve. So it was a difficult thing to create, but it worked out really well for the filmmakers. Right. So this is a picture of Frank Tolman in his later years. Um, one of the big uh, projects that Tallman's was was involved in in the late 1960s, like I said earlier, was uh, was Sketch 22. Tallman's Aviation gathered a total of 18 B-25s from around the country, rebuilt them, re-equipped them to look like combat airplanes, and then flew them down to Mexico and spent six months in Mexico filming the Catch 22, which wasn't released until 1970, but it was a huge effort, as you can imagine. They had to cut this. Uh, this airfield was cut out of uh, the coastline right in uh, on the Gulf of Mexico. Actually, I'm sorry, the Gulf of uh, California, Baja California. And they spent, you can imagine, they had to have flight crews for 17 B-25s, the camera planes, all the logistics of spare engine parts and everything else all moved down to Mexico. And then on top of that, you can imagine the Mexicans, even though they had paved the way, the Mexicans, when they brought 18, 17 B-25 south of the border, a lot of people were like, what's going on with this? And what we got some gun running going on or we have a, a you know, a revolution going on. But anyway, they spent a long time down there. And uh, that's one of the big hallmark uh, things that Tall Man's did was, was Catch-22. And like I mentioned earlier, they also were involved in filming 
um, The Great Waldo Pepper. And this was a film that was near and dear to Frank Tallman's heart because he loved these old airplanes and he it was kind of like a chance for him to do a showcase of of what he had in his collection, the pilots he had available to fly the films, have the camera planes available. It took many months to film that, but it was something that Frank Tolman was very proud of when he was done with it. And if, if you want to see a good example of what Tolman's aviation would do in producing a film, this is the example, this is the best example of what, uh, what uh, Frank Tolman uh, was doing in the 19, late 60s and early 70s. Like I said, Frank Tolman was missing a leg. He, he lost it in 1965, but he requalified in all the airplanes. You can imagine flying a, a World War I vintage airplane that didn't have brakes or a steerable tailwheel or even a tailwheel at all. Tailwheel at all. It probably had a skid, but the amount of skill and uh, persistence it took him to requalify in these airplanes with only having one leg. So he was remarkable in that respect, and, uh, well noted for that. Unfortunately, he was killed in an accident in 1978. He was flying back after doing scouting for a film, um, I think in the Santa Barbara area, and he was on his way back to Orange County flying a Piper Aztec. And if you can believe it, he was scud running and flew into the back of a mountain there, Saddleback Mountain in, uh, in Southern California, and he was killed instantly. It was one of those hard to believe tragic accidents, but I think he, he bet one time too many they could get through a situation that uh, was challenging him. So, so after Tallman was killed, it was quite a, you know, that was, that really put a real damper on the prospects of the company. There were still, there were a number of other pilots flying for Tallman's uh, notably Frank Pine, who was a longtime employee. He flew the B-25 camera ships for most of the operations that they flew in the 60s and 70s. So he took over as the, uh, as the president of Tallman's, and he, he pressed on, uh, losing all of the connections in Hollywood, uh, first with Mance going and then with Tallman going, really put a damper on the ability of Tolmans to get into some of the big Hollywood projects in the 70s uh, or in, in the 80s in particular. So the company basically segued more into a, into a fixed space operator at Orange County uh, selling fuel, but they still had their airplanes available. And when Hollywood came calling, they, they still would, would go out and fly um, for the films. They were involved in some examples in the late 70s. They flew Bob Bob Black Sheep. Uh, they flew The Final Countdown, which was a science fiction film. Um, a lot of commercials, a lot of uh, TV series. They would have they would have uh, either film the series themselves, or they have airplanes that would appear. So they were they were busy, but they weren't nearly as busy and didn't have the same cachet as they'd had in the decade before that. So we'll talk about the camera ships a little bit here. Um, like I said, uh, these were specially modified B-25s for the main camera ships. They had camera positions in the nose and the tail and the two waist positions. And they were the ones in the tail actually were the ones most utilized, but for certain kind of filmings, then, then the nose position was used. The waist positions were not as much, but if a, cam a particular shot required a, uh, a some footage from the waist positions, they could shoot that also. You can see the bubble behind the cockpit on the upper fuselage that was used as an observer position for an aerial director who was wired in via radios to other aircraft being flown or to people on the ground. It just provided a central point for, for the uh, uh, production effort to be done. So this circle vision camera that Walt Disney produced back in the late 1950s was kind of an interesting creation. 
It started with 11 16 millimeter cameras that were all mounted in a ring. And they were similar to what Circa, 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 Circa Rama, I'm sorry, Cinerama, similar to what Cinerama had. They would film simultaneously 360 degrees around. And then when they produced the film later, they would just simultaneously uh, display the film, project the film on a special circle vision uh, uh, theaters, most notably uh, the ones that are Disneyland. But they've also been shown at World's Fairs and other places around, around the world. Uh, later on, it was refined to, ca to have nine uh, cameras shooting 35 millimeter film and that was one that in the 1970s 1980s were were how most of these were filmed and you can see that the whole assembly was uh, mounted on a trapeze type mount that came out of the bombay so the camera view from the circle vision camera had no airplane structure in it and it created some very um, spectacular uh, scenes in the films, and I, I don't know how many people saw this at Disneyland, but you had people getting airsick when they were uh, sitting in the theater watching this uh, pr this uh, production. Yeah, it is it is amazing to to see that, um, and and think of the the technology of the the 1950s. Yeah, putting this putting this together. Um, so that was that the the camera rig was actually lowered out of the Bombay and then brought back in, obviously for yeah. landing, because it looks like it's it's longer than the than the uh, Landing gear. Yeah, it was hydraulically operated, and it would it would just extend it for the filming sessions, and and they they created uh, they shot America the Beautiful several times for Walt Disney, uh, different versions. They updated it a couple times. The first one was in 1957, and that went to the World's Fair, I believe, in Belgium, 1957, and then it went on display it at, uh, at uh, Disneyland in 1960. Then they refilmed it a few years later, and then they went to Disney World and, and Disneyland, and plus some of the other Disney facilities around the world. And then they also shot one for the Canadians, and they shot a couple more um, for different customers. So it was it was ideally suited to the B-25 because the Bombay could hold the uh, hold the camera assembly, and not too many airplanes really could have the utility that the B-25 had to to do this type of project. It was fast enough. You could carry the cameras. Um, and I don't know that these days, if they have another airplane besides a V-25, they could fly this uh, this camera. Uh, Learjet, they do a lot of filming nowadays on a Learjet, but a Learjet, you couldn't mount a camera like that on a Learjet. So anyway, yeah. like I said, the uh, tail position on V-25s was the one most utilized for the filming projects. And this scene is from Catch-22 of, uh, of one of the camera ships taxiing in with a camera mounted in the tail. Comance did a lot of airline photography for airline commercials, uh, for not both the airlines and also the airplane manufacturers. And this tail position was where most of that filming was done. They they would fly formation with uh, DC-8s or 707s or whatever the newest project, product was for the airline manufacturers. And Long Beach being close by, Douglas was building airplanes over there, so they were a close company to work with. But I also worked with Boeing and anybody else with Learjet, with uh, uh, any of the companies in Wichita that were building airplanes, business jets, uh, King Airs, whatever. So they did a lot. They had a lot of work. With uh, with various corporations and then also the airlines themselves when they had a United Airlines commercial uh, showing an airplane back in the 60s and 70s, most likely it was filmed from from the tail of one of their B-25s. Another uh, uh, big project that was filmed out of the tail of a B-25 was uh, a military simulator project, and the, they would mount a special camera in the tail of a B-25 and they would fly very fast and very low over various um, military ranges. And then they would take that film and they would reverse it and speed it up 
and then they would be able to project a high speed, low altitude flight for a simulator for, for a combat pilot to train on. So it was a very, they did a lot of military projects like that, as well as the commercial and the film work. So Tall Man's Aviation was basically, if you need an airplane for something special, we have it for you. We have the pilots, we have the capability, we have the equipment that can support it. So they were pretty, they were very busy and uh, they had their fingers in a lot of parts of the aviation business. Yeah, that's, it's, it's pretty pretty innovative to think of, uh, as you were explaining the, the, the military project, I was thinking, well, how, what use would that be <laughs> for a pilot? Because you're going to be looking out the back end. Yeah. But yeah, but reversing it and speeding it up. That's right. So they would, they would be able to simulate a thousand mile yeah. per hour low altitude uh, missions. And they had these weird simulators set up that uh, this was back in the in the 1970s when they didn't have the capability they have now with the uh, simulators. So they, they would produce the film this way and then they would use that projected for the pilots flying the, the simulated combat missions. Amazing. Another interesting uh, thing, go ahead. Yep, I was, I was just gonna say, uh, you, you mentioned Learjet uh, a number of times and, and one of the names that comes to mind on the West Coast with uh, Learjet is Clay Lacey. And was there any yeah. interaction between uh, Clay Lacey and, and Talmans? Yeah, there was. There was a, a period there where the um, the Learjet, Clay Lacey's Learjet started supplanting what Tolman could do. Um, they had some special cameras built for the Learjet that would basically, uh, they were cameras that mounted on the top of the fuselage and below the fuselage, and they were swivel cameras that were controlled remotely. And those those could those proved to be very, uh, uh, they were flexible. Uh, you could, the Learjet could go fast enough. It's you know, some of the problems that the B-25 had flying formation with military airplanes or uh, airliners was eliminated by the Learjet flying it instead. I mean, the B-25 could fly 200, probably full speed, 250 miles an hour, uh, maybe a little bit faster, but at low level, uh, you know, the, you're, you're slowing the airliners down quite a bit to fly formation with the B-25, but it worked really well, but the Learjet was cheaper probably and, and had a lot more utility. So they worked together on some projects, but eventually when Tolmance started fading from the scene, Clay Lacey took over a lot of that business. So they overlapped. I'll mention two other things. One is that um, the only fatality in the filming of Catch-22, out of all that effort, was the cameraman fell out of the back of the tail position on the B-25. It was this airplane. He uh, he also had lost a leg uh, in an accident earlier, so he was he had taken to strapping himself into the tail of the B-25, and he could actually get further out into the position and get better get better shots. Well, during one of these episodes, he wasn't tied in very securely and the airplane hit some bad turbulence and he was basically thrown out of the airplane at low altitude and killed him in the, in the water. So um, the other thing I, I'll mention is when Paul Mance was filming um, Seven, Seven Wonders of the World for Cinerama in the, uh, in the 1956 or 57, that was before the revolution in Cuba. They, they, they were basing out of Havana for a, for a week, and they did a lot of low-level aerial photography in Havana and the Cuba the Cuban countryside around Havana for the film. And in 1962, with the missile crisis, the October 62 missile crisis, the Defense Department came to the filmmakers, and they wanted to review that film to help do target selection for for uh, what could have been uh, a war with Cuba or a war with Russia in Cuba. So it was kind of one of those little footnotes I was able to glean out of a web search one day. But uh, yeah, so Tom Mance, or Paul Mance provided some help to the Defense Department when they were doing tar target selection in, uh, in Cuba. They had other camera ships too. Um, they modified a B B-26 or an A-26 invader with a similar type of uh, Cinerama camera nose on it. They, according to Frank Pine, who I interviewed 
Um, this was shortly the year after Frank Tomlin was killed. I was started doing research on an article, and I talked to to um, Frank Pine, who was then the president of the company, about this airplane, and he uh, he told me that it was a great airplane to have, but they couldn't find much of a use for it. He said that the uh, they bought this airplane because Douglas Aircraft at Long Beach wanted a Douglas product to film Douglas airliners. So they kind of insisted that Tallman's buy a B-26 to use for this. Well, they went out and tried to film. And unfortunately, the B-26 does not have a, a tail camera position. So they could shoot a little bit out of the nose, but when they actually got down to the nuts and bolts, they needed a tail camera position. So they had to use a B-25, much to Douglas's displeasure, but they got the film they wanted. So this airplane was primarily used for military projects. Uh, it was faster than the B-25s, and they could use it uh, in special projects, but it really wasn't used very much. Um, so it, it basically went, was sold and went away because Tomans couldn't put it to enough good use. This was another one of the camera planes. It was that P-12, as you can see on top, the camera mounted um, for filming purposes, and uh, Frank Tallman was in the cockpit ready to go fly some film. And this was just an example of the kind of variety that Tallman's would provide. Another, some other camera planes. This P-40 in the top top right has a a uh, on the out, on, outboard of the left landing gear. You can see a pod that has mounts a camera. And on the side of the pod, you can see Paul Mance Air Service is on it. This would be a special camera installation that Paul Mance put together, uh, probably for filming a dogfight or who knows what, but it was particularly useful on a P-40. The other two airplanes here were widely used for filming. Uh, when they needed an airplane slower than a B-25, then they would roll out either this Curtis Junior airplane on the, on the left, which you can see if a cameraman sitting in front, you, he has basically an unobstructed view forward and to the each side of the airplane for very slow flying. This was great. And then on the bottom right was uh, a Stinson, L1 Stinson, that was also very popular with filmmakers uh, from the aft cockpit position, which was open air, they could film. And they also had special mounts under the wings. They could mount cameras under either or both of the wings to do forward filming. So, you know, these guys were basically whatever a director or a producer needed for a film shot, these guys would figure out a way to make it happen. And these, of course, this was in the day before CGI and some of the fancy stuff they do now. Most of the stuff had to be filmed real time. So, I have on my website, I have a list of projects that Tolmans was involved in between 1961 to 1985. And that list has 334 projects. So that averaged 14 projects per year and it included huge projects like Catch-22 and then also minor projects like TV commercials, uh, also military projects, um, just a whole variety. Some of them you can't figure out what they were, but you get you get an idea of the scope of what the company was doing in those in those uh, 24 years. Um, it was very busy. When I was uh, at Orange County, I was a flight instructor there for for several years, and it was not uncommon to have a tall man's B-25 taxing out uh, to go on a, on a on a mission somewhere. I know. I remember one time a tall man's B-25 was doing its run up. There at the north end of Orange County Airport, and the Cessna 150 managed to taxi behind it and got blown upside down. So it was kind of a up close and personal way to see these airplanes fly. Another memory I have, particularly have that I I have is when they were getting ready to film Catch 22 in in the uh, in 1968, and Paul Mans would bring in four or five flight crews at a time to do formation practice and they, you know, breaking, shaking the airplanes out. And so I'd be walking home from school. I was in 
so it would have been eighth, eighth grade. And I'd be just walking, minding my own business, and all of a sudden, five B-25s would flow, fly over a low altitude on their way back in to Orange County. And it <laughs> it was weird because nobody else seemed to care about it. But I tell you, the few aviation geeks was kind of freaked out every time that happened. That was a regular occurrence for a couple months as Tomas was getting ready to film um, Catch-22. It was one of those things where, you know, it's, you're not going to see that happen again. And it was it's just a special memory for me. I had the same thing with the B-17. Tall man's got a B-17 they were going to use to film a movie called The Thousand Plane Raid. And same thing. I was out in junior high school one day, and this I saw this airplane coming toward me at about 1,500 feet. And I thought, what in the world is that? I thought it was a DC-4. The closer it got, I realized it was a B-17, and I was a B-17 freak at the time. And... I couldn't believe it. Um, the thing flew right over me really low, banked in, back over toward Orange County and went into the traffic pattern and landed. He flew over a couple more times later that day. So this was January of 1968. And 10 years later, 11 years later, in, uh, in 1979, was I interviewing Frank Pine. And I asked him about that flight, about that B-17. And he pulled out his logbook and he went to that page and he said, yeah, that was the day that he and two other pilots were getting check rides from the FAA. And uh, that's why they were out flying around. So that was kind of special, kind of connected the whole thing for me. So anyway, like I said, I have a website, tollmans.com. And if there's anybody who really wants to delve into this a little bit, this website is just for you because I have all the little tidbits about Tom Mance and Paul Mance and Frank Tallman and the airplanes they had and the projects they flew and some deep dives on some specific airplanes. So I would encourage anybody who has any interest in, in Tom Mance or any of these topics I've talked about today, take a look at the website. It's easy to find, tallmance.com. And hopefully it will answer some questions and give you a couple hours of good reading. Oh, it certainly will. Yes, <laughs> I found I found myself uh, just engrossed in all the information that's that's there and that sort of the uh, the idea behind a little bit of this uh, this webinar because it really when you think of uh, you know Hollywood and and aerial photography and things that, that has gone on through the years uh, and to see how things have progressed and then to realize that these are you know, two of the, the pioneers of that. Um, it's it's been some very some very interesting reading. Uh, we've got some some questions here from uh, some of our some of our viewers. Um, you had mentioned Paul Mance in the Bendix races. You said he won three times. Yeah. Okay. The three the first three post war races uh, he won, and he had two Mustangs. He entered both Mustangs, but he flew the one he flew was the one that won. Those three races. He also flew a couple of Bendix races in the in the 1930s, but he did not win those. But okay. figured out how to do it, and and that was a transcontinental race that started right. in Southern California and usually went to Cleveland. Yep. So it was a, it was a long range race. All right. One of our viewers is wondering. Um, there's a, a story that that is out there that says that uh, uh, Paul Mance picked up a number of surplus aircraft uh, whose Gas uh, in, in the or fuel in the gas tanks paid for the acquisition of the aircraft. Can you uh, confirm that? Yes. Ah. In 1946, he was one of the he was the first guy to buy a a field size lot of surplus warplanes. He had 475 airplanes he picked up, and he envisioned taking the best of the warplanes and and taking to the West Coast is kind of a Hollywood Air Force, but he couldn't find anybody who wanted to finance that. So he took the B-25 and the Mustangs and several other airplanes and had the rest scrapped. And before they scrapped them, they drained all the fuel out of the airplanes. And the selling the fuel, they got back their initial investment in, in purchasing the lot of airplanes. So, yeah, it worked out well for him. It certainly he, did. He was a pretty shrewd businessman. He, he knew how to promote himself and he knew how to – he talked to the right people all the time, so he was he knew what he was doing. What would you rate as either Talman or, or, or Mance's most innovative or greatest achievements uh, in aviation? Well, 
With Tolman, I would say it was organizing Catch-22. Okay. Um, that was took several years and a lot of effort, and you can imagine the logistics involved with that. Mance would be harder would be harder to nail down because he was he was very involved in several big industry I mean big efforts between Amelia Earhart and Cinerama and probably he was best known for producing some incredible aerial photography, which is not easy to do. You, you think about the lighting, the trying to get the formations lined up, and I've read several accounts where people were they were very impressed by his ability to set up a camera shot and make it work with the lighting and the formation airplanes, all the, all the different elements that came together for a good uh, film scene. And he did that several times, um, several notable films that he, he was involved in that uh, those are spectacular scenes to even see today. And one I would recommend Strategic Air Command, the takeoff scene of a B-36 that, that Mance filmed at, uh, in Texas. It's, uh, it's just a, it's a scene on YouTube, but it's a, well worth a, a few minutes of your time to, to see how that, just imagine how they filmed it, but it's a very impressive scene in itself. Yeah, it is. It is. And there was a the question that I had and also one of our viewers had. So Strategic Air Command, it's released in 1955. So this is... Um, this is not today's technology. And right. how exactly, I mean, it's, it's one of the most beautiful aerial, well, it starts on the ground and, and, and becomes an aerial sequence. Yeah. Uh, how did they film uh, the actual takeoff? Obviously, once the airplane, the B-36 is in the air, then you're using the B-25 or something else as a camera ship. But uh, I've often been fascinated how they, they got the ground uh, takeoff. When you look at it closely, you can see that the B-36 is lined up on the right side of the runway. And the B-25 is on the left side, and that was the first time that Mance used the special camera nose on his airplane. Before that, he had just modified a B-25 uh, nose section. It was just a simple modification, but with that film was the first time they actually used that, that wraparound glass camera nose. And they basically just positioned behind the B-36 and flew formation all through the takeoff roll. It's a pretty impressive scene. And the pilot of the B-36, he, ex he expected to have this long briefing with Mance before they did the uh, that takeoff scene and the air-to-air -air stuff that followed it. And they sat down and talked about it a little bit, but Mance said, you just fly the airplane. I'm going to fly around you to, to get the shots I need. And that's how they did it, Mance. Move his B-25 around as he needed for the cameras, cameramen on board to get the shots they needed. So, wow, yeah, an, an incredible piece of film, yeah, uh, filmmaking. And now, I mean, and then later on, the air-to-air -air photography yes. in that in that movie also very impressive. <laughs> he he was such a good aerial director. He even had the clouds come in at just yeah. the right. <laughs> Well, you read some of these accounts and how they would go searching for clouds and, yeah. and have to wait for the right time. I mean, imagine some of the scenes, um, how long it would take to get some of that stuff. But, you know, he was getting paid good money. He, he was he was happy. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, do any of the uh, Talmans, uh camera platforms still exist today? Are any of those aircraft still around? Yeah. The, um, the B-25 that Mance flew and loved, well, loved, he, he really had a good feeling for that airplane. It unfortunately would crash. Paul Mance sold the airplane in 1975, and it was uh, purchased, but went through a couple of people's hands, but eventually it was used for drug running and it crashed in Columbia. The second B-25 they had, the, the one that uh, I've had several pictures of, that airplane is currently flying as uh, God and Country with the, uh, Midland, uh, so the Mid America Air yes, Museum yeah. in, in Texas, and that B twenty five was also used after Tom Man sold it and went out of business. They it was used to film Battle of Britain in nineteen eighty nine, and a couple other films too. So it carried on as a film, uh, filming airplane, but then it eventually lost its camera nose, which the Mid-America Air Museum still has in storage, so it's available if anybody wants to make a movie. 
Um, there you go. And when Tolmans folded up, before they sold in 1985, most of their airplane collection was sold to Kermit Weeks. His must, the Mustang and all, the whole collection went to Kermit Weeks. And most of the spare parts that, um, that Tolmans held went to um, Bill Clare's at Rialto Airport, which now is over at Colorado Springs as the museum there. Okay. So the parts are still around and the airplanes are still around and a lot of history in some of those airplanes. Definitely. Uh, Great Waldo Pepper, we've referenced that a couple of times. Um, and our viewer is asking, it seems to be a, a sort of a, re, a rendition or a recreation of Howard Hughes' wings. How close, uh, if at all, was the uh, Great Waldo Pepper to the reality of the wings production? Hmm. That's going back a ways. Yeah, I can't answer that real well because I, I was not, I'm not really familiar with the wings, what the actual plot line was. Yeah. Um, but I know that, you know, that, that was a good movie. I mean, even for somebody who's not interested in aviation, it's a good movie. And I, I don't know the comparison to the plot line, but it was just a good movie. Some great footage in that one, too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, did they get the idea to do all of the filming from Howard Hughes uh, in some of his movies? I'm not sure. The guy who, who put it together um, was a well-known director, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. And I don't know where they got the idea, but it was um, Tolman uh, jumped on the idea. Of, of basically, they were able to roll all their airplanes out of the hangar and use them. But yeah, I, I can't say for sure where where the idea for that film came from. Okay. And was uh, Paul Mance one of the first acc accredited or approved aerial directors in Hollywood? Yeah, he was. And he, he actually got his director's card from whatever guild. The director's He's, Guild of America. <laughs> yeah. And he got credited as a director in several films. So he was not just the aerial coordinator okay. or the aerial director. He was actually one of the directors. Uh, listed in the credits for some of the aerial filming. So excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up tonight? No, I just appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about Tolman's aviation because uh, it's an interesting subject to me. And the website was the book I didn't write that I finally figured out there's some books you shouldn't write, but that website is the result of, uh, of that research. And it's, I try to add to it as I find information. So it's, it's a good place to go. Great, Scott. We appreciate you uh, taking time to, uh, to share your thoughts tonight. And uh, like you, this is a topic that's close and near and dear to my heart. I, I studied uh, filmmaking in college and be able to uh, combine uh, airplanes and, and filmmaking together has always been has always been a little bit of passion in my, in my world. So thank you again for uh, for sharing your insights tonight. My pleasure. And uh, have a good evening. Take care. All right. Hey, if there's uh, an idea for any topics you'd like to uh, hear about in future episodes of Warbird Tube, please send Leah Block an email at media at cafhq.org. Scott, again, thanks for being a part of the show tonight. And until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Bush. Thanks for being here. Have a great night.